Philosophy, physics, and mathematics have found themselves each separately in a conundrum. With all of its technological advancements and gadgetry, with mathematics in a close second, and with philosophy left behind to the dustbins of history, the pole position physics has taken may have caused an imbalance in the disciplines of rigorous thinking, resulting in unexpected consequences. Dead ends. However, imagine that all this time, the actual problem goes back to an unsettled argument between the two originators of the calculus, the mathematics behind physics. What if the calculus itself has incorrect assumptions that have been transmitted generation to generation, no one noticing until now? What if the problem was merely syntax, and that it could have been figured out decades ago? What's so extraordinary about these findings is that they appear to challenge our understanding of how the universe works. Big news out of CERN. No, they still haven't found the Higgs boson, and even if they did, not much physics would change. But what they have found could strike right at the heart of a century of modern physics. We made a very uh, unexpected we observation. Find, we didn't expect to find such uh, an anomaly. From the physics lab at CERN in Geneva, scientists have been firing tiny particles known as neutrinos through the rock all the way to another lab at Grand Sasso in Italy. Scientists in Switzerland shot a particle beam to Italy. They shot a beam of neutrinos to this uh, opera detector that they have in uh, Grand Sasso Mountain in Italy. We found that this speed is not what you would expect, namely very close to the speed of light, but it seems to be a little higher. What scientists found was that neutrinos, these teeny tiny subatomic particles, were actually able to arrive even faster. Uh, the beam of neutrinos arrived 60 nanoseconds than, faster earlier than would have been predicted. It seems from our measurement that the neutrino goes a little faster than light. The neutrinos fired to Italy reached it very slightly faster than expected. A writer for Discover Magazine suggests Lorentz invariance. The idea that everyone measures the speed of light the same way might need some tweaking. A discovery that rocked the physics community a few months back is re-rocking it with a reconfirmation. But at the time of the initial announcement, scientists cautioned more experiments were needed before drawing any conclusions. They've done them and gotten the same results. What we have is both observations right now. They're arguing whether it's moving faster than light, whether it's moving slower. There's something that has to be modified here. There is still a large crowd of skeptical physicists who suspect that the original measurement done in September was an error. Should the results stand, they would upend more than a century of modern physics. But more or less, this is what I predicted would happen in my essay I wrote in 2003 titled The, twin, the Adjusted Twin Paradox. And what that uh, anticipated was there should be a situation where we have a particle where from one perspective it arrives early but from another perspective it arrives late. A physicist told WNET's 13 this doesn't mean Einstein was wrong. Einstein's theory works really well. It's been tested. So what would it mean? Well it might mean that the assumptions he made were only approximations. So if you look here what we end up with is more or less this. And what this is saying is that, no, the neutrino is not moving faster than the speed of light. There's this extra thing happening that relativity doesn't account for. Are the assumptions we're making absolutely true, or do they break down at some point? And so it appears to be going faster than light, but it isn't. So once you account for it properly, we find out that, no, it's just doing what it's supposed to. It's just our equations need a little bit more tinkering. It looks like the experiment that rocked the physics community was just a bad case of wiring. KTRK reports scientists are saying, oops. An earth-shattering discovery was actually a mistake, according to scientists in Geneva. A, a faulty connection between a GPS receiver and a computer created the false reading. When they first reported their surprising findings, the OPERA team were clear that they were not definitely saying neutrinos could travel faster than light, but were simply revealing what they had observed. Still, the physics world had a fun few months picking apart the data. They suggested everything from relativity itself, throwing off the measurements, to simple math errors. But Science Insider spoke to a source saying the loose wire seems to account for the finding. 
After tightening the connection and then measuring the time it takes data to travel the length of the fiber, researchers found that the data arrived 60 nanoseconds earlier than assumed. A writer for Popular Science says, frankly, this is so boring as to sound almost suspicious. These people with their five sigmas and their M-brains and their beta particles just forgot to push the plug in all the way. The scientists say they aren't sure the cable was loose when they took their measurements. What's more, they found another technical issue that could have affected the results, complicating things even more. The two issues would skew the results in opposite directions, which is why they will need new measurements to better understand whether both influence the results and, if so, what the net impact. Is. The researchers plan to run the test again in May with the cables plugged in this time. Our story begins with the European Council for Nuclear Research, better known to the general public as CERN. The controversy. Recently, experiments with the Large Hadron Collider turned up results showing neutrinos apparently traveling faster than light. The coincidence. Meanwhile, Gavin Wentz, a mild-mannered philosopher, predicted such an event would occur nearly 10 years prior and set out to do a press release, whereupon he was astonished to find out he was a moment behind. The cover-up. CERN announced that its controversial experimental data was the result of loose, jiggly wires. Gavin Wentz races to beat the clock as he now has found himself in the Temporal Zone. The two public faces of the Opera collaboration, the experiment that seemed to show neutrinos moving faster than the speed of light last fall, have stepped down, reportedly over disagreements from the team on how they handled the media. An Italian professor who thought he'd disproved Einstein's theory of relativity has resigned after it turned out he hadn't. But wait, is that really how it played out? Air to Tato's colleague Dario Altiero, who presented the neutrino results at CERN, also stepped down Friday, telling Nature the researchers never said they disproved Einstein. Despite the fact that Opera itself never claimed to overturn Einstein's theory, keeping its claims narrowly to the report of an anomalous measurement, many newspapers depicted it that way. Although technical issues seem to have been the cause of the speedy neutrino results, last fall the physics world exploded, trying to make sense of their results. Air to Tato and Altiero say physicists' excitement was unfairly translated into Einstein was wrong headlines. But critics say the results should have been kept secret until they were vetted. A writer for Science 2.0 says it would have been impossible to keep the findings from leaking anyway, and muzzling scientists isn't the way to go. Both Opera and its sister experiment Icarus are scheduled to rerun the neutrino experiment at the end of this month, though most experts expect the particles to obey the speed limit this time. Something is seriously wrong with this picture. This argument is supported by faulty wire. There is a hidden negative sign in this equation below. A cover-up. Something they didn't want you to see. A fact revealing what is actually wrong with this data. Are you prepared to find out? Because it is now too late. For you have already entered into the temporal zone. to CERN mathematically trying to account for this apparent superluminal activity. What we have here is an image of your traditional Minkowski diagram, your one dimension of time with your three dimensions of space and superimposed on it is a three dimensional time coordinate system. And what I propose is that when you modify relativity and account for three dimensions of time that a lot of the anomalous data in modern experiments tends to disappear and everything goes back to uh, science as usual. This is 
the actual data from CERN. What the dilemma was is that they calculated the time it would take for light to arrive. 1,048 nanoseconds for the light to reach Grand Sasso, Italy from CERN. What the problem was is that after they measured the neutrinos and they added up all of the corrections to their equations to account for the time, they could only get a number of 987 nanoseconds. So when you subtract the two, what you end up with is an extra 60 nanoseconds. And what that extra 60 nanoseconds means is that the neutrino arrived 60 nanoseconds before it should have. If you go online and get the CERN PDF that has all the data on this that was published in September of 2011, you'll see that it's quite an extensive document and that the scientists spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to account for this extra 60 nanoseconds. And after months and months and after 15,000 tries, they couldn't get rid of the data. So they came out with a press release. We found that the speed is not what you would expect, namely very close to the speed of light. But it seems to be a little higher. What scientists found was that neutrinos, these teeny tiny subatomic particles, were actually able to arrive even faster. What we have is we have a generation of some particles. They hit a target. And the target, the particles decay, generate some neutrinos. The neutrinos travel along this trajectory and ended up at the opera detector, the satellite data from the opera detector, and from CERN is where we ended up with the data with the extra 60 nanoseconds. While they were doing this test with the opera detector, they also had another detector running, which was called the Icarus detector. So here we can see these are the Icarus results. Icarus was not testing to measure whether or not the neutrinos were traveling faster than light or not. They were just simply measuring certain properties of neutrinos, and in that data set there was nothing unusual to indicate the neutrinos moving faster than light. So they used that data to come up with these figures. Now what I would like to bring to your attention is something that slipped past everybody, is that there's actually something extremely wrong with this equation. And what's wrong with it is that if you look here, you'll notice that the dotted line is slightly to the right of zero, which would indicate that this is a positive number, as we can see here. We'll notice opera is a positive number as well. What the reality is, is this equation was gauged so that it only gives positive answers for particles moving faster than light. Meaning, these guys already anticipated this problem, and in the way they designed the equation, they actually had to hide a negative sign in the equation so that the answers would always come out positive. The example I'll give here is, let's say I, I decided to hop in an airplane and fly from there down to Italy. This would be the time of flight of Gavin. We all know that I cannot fly an aircraft faster than light, so notice that the value of time that it takes for me to get to Italy will always be greater than the length of time it takes for light. So for all objects that travel slower than the speed of light, this value is always going to be larger than this value, which means this will always be a negative number. So the fact that the equation was set up to not give a negative number means that the scientists at CERN know there's a problem with the mathematics. And as you can see in Wentz versus Susskind, two so it looks like there's something nasty going on at r equals 2mg. At r equals 0, there's also something funny happening. The coefficient of dt squared blows up. But even worse, it blows up with a negative sign. And in fact, it's interchanging the signs of dt squared and dr squared. What? 
changing the signs of dt squared and dr squared. Changing, changing, changing the signs of dt squared and dr squared. This is negative, and this one is positive. This term has negative, this one has been interchange. I want to invent another variable. We're going to be talking about learning sleight of hand. I hate to introduce another coordinate. Okay, I'm going to do it. I have to. I have no choice. But for this trick, some double-sided tape and two extra cards will do. I'm going to take rho squared and give it a new name. You pick up this card, then you pick up the double back card and this card so that you can show them the back. And they think they're seeing the back of the chosen card. What is dr, d capital R? d capital R is equal to twice rho d rho, right? d rho squared is minus dr squared divided by, in this case, it happens that there's a 4 there. The 4 is not the interesting thing. We could get rid of the 4 by a trick. That's right, the old put and take, where you act like you put something in one hand, but you actually take it away. Everybody see what I did? I just wrote d rho is equal to dr divided by 2 rho, and I stuck it into there. Now it's just a matter of cutting the cards, spreading them out, and there it is. Leonard Susskind himself does a mathematical trick to try and cover up problems with the calculus. Well, I was in, an, in anticipation of this type of thing, and in fact, back in 2003, I had written a series of equations, more or less rewriting special relativity, predicting this exact phenomena. And so what I'd like to do is first show my calibration to the Lorentz transformation as a way of showing what the problem is with special relativity and how I predicted the way special relativity failed with the neutrino experiment and then I'm going to apply that mathematics to the neutrino experiment to show that the existence equations account for both sets of data and that they're actually both correct because there's something happening that special relativity doesn't account for that this data is pointing us in the direction of. These are your basic Lorentz transformation equations and it's extremely simple to understand what the Lorentz transformation is. To make a long story short, the way Newton's calculus works is that all the mathematics corresponding to time is linear. And so in order to allow for the speed of light to be the same in all reference frames, we have to start using some kind of a curved coordinate system in order to trap motion within the speed of light. That being said, this is, these, this is an example of the Lorentz transformation being applied to what's called the twin paradox. And you should be familiar with the twin paradox at this point. And in the twin paradox, the idea is that if you had two twins that were the same age, experiencing the same passage of time, and one of them decided to get into a rocket ship and travel and come back, traditionally, what the Lorentz transformation shows is that the traveling twin is in, an, is in an accelerated frame of reference. Time goes by slower for him. So when he arrives, he's, he's younger than his twin brother who stayed. However, when you apply the existence equations to the Lorentz transformation, what you find is that a very peculiar thing happens well, it happens throughout the whole thing, but it's easiest to see at the midpoint, and that is this, and I'll raise this question. If this twin is traveling in a rocket ship, is experiencing time at a slower 
great than his brother here, then the question is, are, are they actually in the same frame of reference? And, and it becomes real simple. No, they can't be in the same frame of reference. They actually have to be in two distinct frames of reference in order for that to work. And special rel and relativity counts for that quite well. What the problem is, is that if you have two relative frames of reference, then in this relative frames of reference, there has to be a, a traveling brother relative to the brother that stayed. And in this frame of reference, there has to be a brother that stayed relative to the traveling brother. So what the end result is, is because relativity does not account for this extra aspect of relative frames of reference, what I predicted is that if we did the twin paradox, when the twin would arrive, he would realize it took him longer to get there than his calculations predicted, so he would apologize to his brother for being late. However, his brother would be astonished because according to his calculations, the traveling brother has arrived early. So what the problem is, is that the data conflicts. One thinks he's early, the other thinks he's late. And that's exactly what we ended up with here. Here we have the neutrino arriving early. And here we have more or less the equivalent of the neutrino arriving later. And so what the CERN data really is, is a perfect example of what I call the adjusted twin paradox. And by applying the existence equation to this data, what we end up with is that there are two frames of reference, one relative to the neutrino, one relative to the opera detector, and that the way they did the experiment, they were actually mixing data from two reference frames. And so we'll go ahead and kind of work through that. Right here up at the top, these are the adjustments that the existence equations make. In existence, I use the concept that as we get older, time seems to go by faster as an analogy for modifying relative frames of reference. So since we have a younger person over here, we're going to assume that time goes by slower than this older person over here. So in a way, so, so we'll call this gentleman, we'll call him A, we'll call this lady B. So what we know is that the ratio of time of A over B is going to be greater than the ratio of B over A. And so what we would do is solve for this ratio to find out what time is relative to one another. So let's say he's five times her age. Well, what that would mean is a minute to him is five minutes to her, or a minute to her is 0.2 minutes to him. But because we're dealing with relative frames of reference and there's an A relative to a B, a B relative to A, there has to be an A relative to a B relative to A relative to B, so on and so forth infinitely, what I'm applying to reference frames is the concept of an iteration of an infinite series of relative frames of reference and then accounting for that slight shift forward for the individual that's into the future and a slight shift into the past for the individual that's, that's younger, and the existence equations are to calibrate and find where they are in relation to one another. And so that's what we have here, is this is the older person, so where are they in the future relative to the younger person? And here's the younger person, where are they in the past relative to the older person? And then these are the, this is part of the formula for the correction to that timeline. It has been demonstrated that the existence equations, when applied to the Lorentz transformation as a calibration to relativity, can account for both the opera and Icarus data as an explanation for the apparent superluminal results from opera and the apparent conflicting results from Icarus. The only objects that can travel at the speed of light are, are massless things like uh, light. Scientist Robert Plunkett explains the prevailing wisdom about subatomic particles like neutrinos is that they can accelerate to nearly the speed of light, but never faster. 
the speed of light is an absolute cosmic speed limit for uh, the travel of particles. But scientists in Europe claim they have recorded a neutrino particle that broke that cosmic speed limit. If true, the discovery would upend almost a century of research and force scientists to rethink the laws governing mass and movement. One of the other sources is the MINOS experiment at Fermilab. MINOS shoots a particle beam through the Earth to another off-site location. Scientists at the lab clock how fast the particles travel. It's likely that the MINOS experiment is one of the, most, the best checks that can be done on this, uh, on this measurement. But Plunkett says it is easy to make a mistake when trying to measure something as small as a neutrino. He believes the MINOS facility, with an upgrade, can provide a more precise measure of the CERN results. Our plans are to upgrade this equipment using a system of atomic clocks, much like what they have in, a, in the uh, European experiment, to, uh, in fact, do a measurement that's more precise than theirs and better in many ways. But if MINOS-2 clocks a neutrino traveling faster than the speed of light, theorists like Patrick Fox will have their work cut out for them, designing a new foundation for future physics research. A dollar? Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Batavia, Illinois. They found another technical issue that could have affected the results, complicating things even more. The two issues would skew the results in opposite directions, which is why they will need new measurements to better understand whether both influence the results and, if so, what the net impact is. The researchers plan to run the test again in May with the cables plugged in this time. Both Opera and its sister experiment, Icarus, are scheduled to rerun the neutrino experiment at the end of this month, though most experts expect the particles to obey the speed limit this time. If the new results from both Opera and Icarus from the scheduled retest in May confirm the faulty wire connection and the extra 60 nanoseconds are then able to be accounted for, does this mean that the existing applications to relativity are false? Not at all. In fact, this actually brings us right back to the issue regarding the time of flight equation. The only objects that can travel at the speed of light are, are massless things like uh, light. Remember how the Icarus results on average yielded a positive number greater than zero, suggesting even an ever so slight superluminal aspect to the Icarus results? Statistically speaking, of course, there is still a major problem. According to modern physics, the neutrino has mass which means that no matter what, theoretically, not only are neutrinos forbidden from traveling faster than the speed of light, but they are also equally forbidden from traveling the speed of light. And the only objects that can travel at the speed of light are, are massless things like uh, light. It is as if everyone was so concerned about negating the superluminal opera results that the subtle anomaly with Icarus went unnoticed. Therefore, we must wait for the May results to properly calibrate relativity with the existence equations. I guess we are just going to have to wait. So, while we wait, Let's move on to other anomalies that the existence applications to physics appear to account for, shall we?